and waiting on you. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. A new subject this evening while we're between books. I just want to talk to you about the beast. The beast of Revelation. We hear a great deal about it. Some call it this. Some call it that. Some say it's a number. Some go as far as saying, no, it's a machine in Belgium. Hey, it's written in our Father's Word what the beast is. Why do people play guessing games and deceive people when we can go to our Father's Word and understand it totally and clearly? And I thank Him for the Word whereby we have that assurity. Let's just thank Him in the precious name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. The beast. Naturally, I want you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We could even call this the beast chapter. But now... God uses symbology. Why does he use symbology? Because symbology, when it's correctly understood, uh, makes it very simple as to what God's meaning and subject matter is. And that's what he wants you as a Christian to know and to understand. Man fears only the unknown. So if you don't know about the beast, if you don't know what it consists of, you're going to be a little afraid of it, a little leery. Well, I don't want anything to do with no beast. Well, you might if you know it's your destiny. But you might have a great deal to do with it in opposition to it. You might find that all your teachings from God's Word, your growth in that Word and in your Father, was designed specifically to bring you to a point to serve your father against the beast. Now, what are we talking about then? God uses creatures, anything created as an example, as uh, giving it a sim in symbology a meaning Sometimes due to horticulture, anthropology, zoology, whatever the case might be, you must become proficient within those subjects to truly understand if he uses something, such as an eagle. What does it mean? Well, Father's Word explains. So, he explains as well what this beast is. Let's read of it. Chapter 13 in the book of Revelation. Revelation means to reveal and to uncover. So let us uncover the identity of the beast. All right. Chapter 13, the book of Revelation, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand. I want you to picture John. He's standing upon the sand of a beach, on a sandy beach, of the sea. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. I saw him come up out of the water having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Do you know why people wear crowns? Because they're a king or a queen of some particular festival or location. So that's basically self-explanatory, is it not? And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, which is to say his purpose was to defame the name and the word of God. The whole thing designed for this. Now, you know that in God's natural creation, we do not have seven-headed monsters. We just don't have them. They're not there. Therefore, he is using symbology. But do you know that God doesn't give you symbology without a very clear and specific explanation? Don't ever let man mess you around as to, about, as to who this beast is or what it is. First of all, I want to make one point, and then we're going directly to the explanation. You must understand this one thing, or you're never going to understand end-time prophecy concerning the beast system. In this book of Revelation, this chapter, rather, in the book of Revelation, we find two beasts. One is political, one is religious. Naturally, if it has more than one head, it's political. A religious leader, however, though, is singular. And we have one head. And, of course, that one head is the chief religious leader of the end times 
in a spurious sense, which is to say falsehood, lies, deception. Naturally, then, we know from common sense that we're talking here about a multi-headed political system, meaning there's going to be the crowns or kings. We're going to have ten kings. But you don't have to play guessing games. Turn over quite simply to the 17th chapter of this great book of Revelation. I want to pick it up with the 12th verse. Let's take the horns first. Now, first of all, come with me. Observe uh, John standing on a beach overlooking a sea of water, and this thing comes from it, rises out of the water. Now, let's understand what the water is, what the horns are, what the heads are, etc. Okay. Um, Verse 12 of Revelation 17. He has just told us in the prior verse that Antichrist will only be one hour the son of perdition and that these kings will only be kings for one hour. We hear of it here now, picking it up in verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest. You saw the ten horns? What are they? The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Now take the guessing games out of it. Is they're quite simply ten kings, no more, no less, which have received no kingdom as yet. Now this is very important in prophecy. None of those ten kings, they rule simultaneously. They rule all rather at the same time. They're not a, a, a king line that in succession, one after the other, but all at one time. But they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. What beast? The religious beast, of course, who is the son of perdition. He goes into perdition from verse 11. That will be the religious beast. But I want to take part of the mythology that man has placed upon this through the simplicity that God has placed in the horns. Horns always... They're, they are an Hebrew idiom that means power, all right? This is an earthly power. So these ten horns are ten kings, their power on this earth, but they will not one little, not the least of them will reign except for one hour when the son of perdition comes into being. That also is symbolic for that one hour describes the five-month reign in Revelation chapter 9. I'm not going to digress a great deal because I want to stick to the subject. What is the explanation of the thing John saw rise? Now, we know now that when the horns came up on those seven heads, that there are ten people. We're talking about ten world leaders. Ten world leaders that will rule only after Antichrist or the religious beast appears upon this earth. So take all the, shake all the uh, fuzzy wuzzies out of it that you've been taught and see ten men coming up out of the water, meaning appearing on the scene. It's that simple. Okay, verse 13. Let's go further with this. These have one mind. In other words, they all think exactly the same and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, meaning they totally uh, pledge their allegiance and their loyalty to that world religious leader. That world religious leader, you're going to be told by a few knuckleheads that it's a false prophet. Hey, friend, the false prophet will not surface and make himself known worldwide. Neither will Elijah, the good prophet. But... This uh, religious beast, who, who is none other than Antichrist, the role, the dragon, the role that Satan played in the world that was in this one as well, in the final closure. 14, they shall make war with the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? I think you would know. It's Jesus Christ. In other words, these ten kings all have the same thought in mind. That's to pledge allegiance to instead of Christ, and make war with the Christ, the Lamb slain, the Lamb of God. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Praise God, we've got the victory. 
Do you know why? God is calling out some and giving them intelligence to know and to understand the simplicity in which he taught. As we see the superpowers in the world, peace, 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 that's being cried. As ten leaders certainly will take over, this, and then the seven heads uh, being seven dominions, regions, whatever you want to call them, geographical locations worldwide with all leaders paying respect to this supernatural entity that is able to perform miracles in the sight of people. Hey, don't spiritualize it away, friend. These things are facts, and they shall come to pass. Now, many of you have wondered about that beast, that first one. Beast, what a beast. No, it's just ten kings. No more, no less. That's it, friend. Ten kings, ten earthly men. As far as the headship is concerned. For he is the Lord of Lords. We're back to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you know why I emphasize the fact that some of you are called? That you're God's elect? That you have eyes to see and ears to hear? It's because you know you do. And you're not buying the stuff that is commonly taught. You'd rather use a little common sense and take away the mysteries that people utilize as scripture lawyers to build people when the word is so simple. The beast is headed by ten kings, and the kings are headed by a world religious leader. We'll document that back in the 13th chapter. But they come across the lamb, the lamb slain, of course. Why is it he called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Because he will appear on the scene as Lord of Lords and King of Kings with the saints and shall defeat them. It's well written throughout this book. 15. And he saith unto me, The waters. Now, now here's the sea. I want to explain to you what that sea is that these ten men rose up from. It's really a mystery. Listen to it. How complicated and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, had we begin, that old great harlot, mother, mystery Babylon, was sitting upon waters, which is the same waters that these ten rose from, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. In other words, the waters that the ten kings appear on the surface from are simply the multitudes, all races, all colors, all creeds, the entire world population. You've got ten kings that rise up from seven dominions over the people of the world. And there's, is that difficult? So you see, we didn't see some creature rise up out of a sea. We simply saw ten little old earthly kings rise up out of the people, meaning they were human, they were of the people. They had a dominion. They had seven dominions. Domain. Um, and they ruled. But they ruled under the false Christ. So, what is it that this, well, who is this whore then? It's really quite simple. It's all people that are expecting this great religious leader that's going to rapture them out, and they don't know that spurious Messiah, this one comes first, and they're going to be deceived. There is a warning, and God is allowing it to be delivered just before that day of the Lord. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you'd better thank your father for it. Okay, uh, 16. Listen closely. There's no great mystery about the beast. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, that's those, what are the ten horns on the beast? Do you need to be reminded? They're ten kings that are part of the system. These shall hate the whore. The great church, the apostolic church, that's to say those that go, in, rather those that go into apostasy. They are deceived. These leaders actually hate her. They don't stand for her or with her. And shall make her desolate and naked. You know why they're going to make her naked? Because they're going to take every righteous act that the church has ever committed and strip her of it because she will worship this false one thinking it is the lamb. 
and burn her with fire. They're going to eat her say, naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, this is the stinging burn of the locust. The stinging burn, rather, of the scorpion in Revelation chapter 9, 4. That's what they're going to burn her with. They can't kill her, but they can sure sting her. 17, listen closely. Now, now back up again. You see ten rulers rise up from the peoples of this world, all languages in seven nations, seven dominions, rather. Seven regions, if you prefer. They have the great religious beast over them. They pay their total and complete respect to him. Their purpose is to, make, is to deceive this harlot, the church, the false church, the church that falls into the apostasy. That is to say, they change their professed belief in one day because they truly love the real Jesus. But they don't know because they haven't understood God's word that the fake Jesus comes first. Okay, now listen closely. 17. For God, who has, for Yahweh, Almighty God, has put in their hearts to fulfill His will. Do you understand that those kings, even though their loyalty is to Satan, that they are fulfilling God's will because the negative part of God's plan must come to pass to fulfill the scripture. God is still in control. So you saints... You set aside ones. That's what the word saints means. How precious you are that we have the victory. To fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. These ten rulers, it is God's will that they agree and give their kingdom to the religious system. Until the words, until what? Don't you read over that. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled how fast they are being filled today as you look at the Persian Gulf. Are you familiar with it? We're going to get into the book of Daniel before too long and perhaps I might tell you this is preparation for it. For it speaks and goes into much detail on this same subject. And I don't want you deceived when we have the truth before us. God's word shall be fulfilled. That's why Jesus, when he would be asked a question, he would say, haven't you read? It is written. Are you stupid? Do you not know it's written? It's been before you all the time. Why do you ask a question like that? That's what he's saying. He was disappointed, disturbed, and disgusted sometimes. He groaned when he was asked simple, stupid questions because it was written all the time. But people must be taught into the simplicity of God's word. That's why you can count on it. As it is written, so shall it come to pass. Verse 18. And the woman, this is that great harlot, the old whore, which thou sawest is that great city. You see, it wasn't a woman at all. What great city? Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You know what it is? Babylon. Well, what does Babylon mean? It means confusion. Confusion concerning the real truth of God's word and God's plan that must be fulfilled. That's why they are, they become um, the the um, a part of the apostasy. That's the falling away that P, that Paul mentioned in Second Thessalonians chapter two. He said, "Hey, you got a little confused about my first letter about gathered in the air, and I want to write this second letter to you so that first one doesn't mix you up." about our gathering back to Christ. It's not going to happen until after this son of perdition, the one read of in verse 11 here, comes to this earth and sits in the temple of God claiming to be God to deceive all those that will participate in the falling away. Friend, you're not going anywhere until these events take place. Who is that great whore? That great harlot? It's the confused church and all the citizens and languages of this earth that have not studied our Father's plan and will, for it will happen as the Creator of all things has so declared. Who are you going to be? And who are you going to believe? Then you've heard some idiot tell you that this beast is a machine. What a lie! 
What deception. That's all part of the confusion. Or, or some idiot is going to tell you that this beast and this woman is one particular church and they rise to the forefront and take the front seat in the whole church because they haven't studied their father's word. They're blind and deceived and they're disgusting when they should be scholars of our father's simple plan. Now let's go over it again. How can they say that it's one church, that it's one uh, this or that, a machine, when your father says, hey, those ten horns are ten men. They're ten kings. That's all. They're, over, they're, they, they're only going to come to power for one little bitty hour when Antichrist is on this earth. Otherwise, they're not going to have any power. But they're going to give every nth of their loyalty to him. And you can count on it. That's the way it's going to be. And they're going to rule over the people of this world, not because they love them, but they will actually hate them and strip all their righteous acts because they serve Satan rather than Almighty God. Do you find that confusing? Now, now when you read it drawn out and explained what that beast, sim using symbolism as God was, that it's ten men, don't ever let anybody confuse you. The simplicity in which Christ taught is really too much for some minds because they must complicate or confuse because they are part of that harlot church, Babylon. Beware of those that confuse in their teaching as to what the simplicity of the fact is. What did John see rise from the sea? Ten king rulers and a deceived bunch of people. The waters were the people and they're confused uh, and who was the whore? She's the apostasy itself, that great city Babylon, which is the confused state of mind. What does Babel, Babylon mean? It comes from the base root Babel, which means to Babel, confusion. And how some people like to confuse people. So will you not forget that? That's a world political system. So jot it down in your margin. This first beast that rises from the sea, it's ten kings. That will rule one hour or a one hour period symbolically, the five months period of Antichrist. And they will deceive the world if it's possible. But they won't love the people of the world. They'll use them. Verse 2, back to Revelation 13, verse 2. Let's go with it. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. The dragon is Satan. Always is, always has been. Was in the world it was, Revelation chapter 12. It's his title in the, at the end of the last age just before the fall. And it is his title in the end of this earth age just before the overthrow, the fall. We will be getting into the book of Daniel and I will explain these various governments the leopard, the bear, and the lion, uh, in, and the, um, the beast that is not necessarily described. We will explain him in detail. We're going deeper than we've ever gone before by the gift of the Holy Spirit that simplifies prophecy whereby people can understand. So, these simply, as for the time, moment in the time being, has always been the power of the Kenites. Down through the ages, Daniel will clarify, bringing us up to the end generation, whereby Antichrist shall take hold, Antichrist shall take over. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now what are we talking about here? One of its heads, what are we talking We're talking about a political system. Its power operates on loyalty to Antichrist. We see them start trying together and to come to power. You see it today when you see Esau and Jacob meet at the same table and sign peace treaties. It's very biblical. It's part of God's scripture. I'm talking about the United States of America and, and uh, Russia. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Do you know who healed the wound? You'll find out in the next verse. Who wounded him? 
it will be those people that know their God and stand against, if you would. People can't get along anyway. And until Antichrist appears on the scene, they're never going to quite get this peace, 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 peace thing all together. And that's why God told you when you hear that cry, they'll be careful because sudden destruction is soon coming, meaning the dragon. Now listen closely, verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Who did the beast totally give its power to? The dragon, which is who? Satan, that old dragon, the devil. You'll read of it back in the 12th chapter. It's one of his titles. And they worship the beast. They worship the political system, saying, Who is likened to this political system, this beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who is able to make war with this one world, total power and peace, with all total disarmament? Praise God they will say. You can't make war if all nations are hit by one, and that's the dragon, and they will be, as a religious leader. Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's forty and two moons. Anytime a prophecy is given in our Father's Word and it is given in days, that's solar. That's a, a prophecy given to the children of light. Anytime it is given in moons, which is of the night, it's of the devil. And it's a prophecy concerning his reign. You're always taught that um, 1260 days is three and a half years and 42 months is three and a half years. Well, there's a 10-day difference, dear one. That 10 days could be very different in as much as the children of the day have a 10-day time of preparation if they understand God's Word. Enough said on that subject for the moment. I understand this. A, a solar day is a little bit longer than one moon day, all right? Because the moon doesn't quite... Uh, uh, get all the way around in one day, all right, etc. Six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In other words, he, who's dwelling in heaven at this time? Almighty God and Christ at his right hand. Well, what is this, his tabernacle? Do you, have you not read that God tabernacled with men in a tabernacle of flesh. It's the many-membered body. He's going to blaspheme them for telling the truth. That also is covered in Daniel in much more detail. We'll be going into it in that detail. How is it that he blasphemes the name of God? Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a chapter I was just referring to a moment ago. He says, Paul, that the son of perdition, that one which is Antichrist, will stand in the temple of God, the tabernacle of God, claiming to be God. Hey, that's blasphemy. And listen, dear Christian, those of you that are deceived and think that the first supernatural Messiah that appears on this earth very soon is Jesus, you're going to blaspheme too because you're going to worship Satan. You're going to turn yourself into a prostitute because you're supposed to remain a virgin until Jesus Christ returns to this earth to take part in the true wedding, not this fake wedding that's coming up soon. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Do you know who the saints are? That's the set-aside ones, the called ones, those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, and to overcome them. That means to deliver them up. Did Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 not tell you that you would be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, that you were not to premeditate what you would say beforehand, but that the Holy Spirit himself would speak through you at that moment? For what purpose? For a witness and a testimony to the fact that this fake was sitting in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus to rapture people out, not the true Messiah. You, this generation, will see this come to pass. If you don't believe it now, you believe it when it does come to pass, for indeed it shall. It shall happen in and to this generation. 
and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In other words, he brought one worldism into a total uh, success. That's what the religious system is, is to call and be called one worldism. So it shall be. There will be no more wars, there will be no wars made with it, for all nations will belong to it. Verse 8, you listen closely. He's going to make war with the saints, meaning delivering them up, converting them. What does a religious leader do? Does he kill people to convert them? No. He converts them through revival. And you'd better get your mind in that frame to understand that's the danger of Antichrist, is false teachings and revival. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That's what it said. It said every living soul. No, it said all shall worship him. Whose? Now here we have a qualifier. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God's elect that were predestined were chosen because in the last dragon episode, they had the courage and the guts to stand up and be men. And that is to say, people, no gender, people of the living God. And so shall they again in the near future. Do you want to be a champion of your people? Have you known you had a destiny and a purpose all your life? Have you not been able to be fulfilled from the so-called church because it does not break down the word of God in the simplicity in which your father wrote it to you? Then come out of confusion and come into truth. Gather into the true family of God and study his word. Verse 9, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. I want to cover one more verse. 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Do you hear the true word of God? Then become a captive of the living Savior. Put on the gospel armor and be prepared to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. They're religious darts. Darts of conversion. Nothing to fear. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Do you remember Esau? Hates part of it, friend. Esau was promised, you shall also become a strong nation, but you will live by the sword and you shall die by the sword. That atheistic, communistic, ungodly nation. What is the sword of the end times? Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. The tongue of the living Savior is a two-edged sword and he speaks from your mouth when you're delivered up. Do you have a destiny? Do you have a purpose? Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That completes for this chapter 13, the religious beast. I don't like to call it a beast. It's a political system. If you don't recognize that, you'll never understand the book because God himself explained it so clearly in that chapter 17. In the next lecture, we're going into the religious beast and some of the shenanigans he will pull. Do you know what this religious beast looks like? It looks like the Lamb of God. It looks like that picture of Jesus that you have on your wall. That's why so many people will rush to him. They've been told all their life that Satan has two horns, that he dresses around in, in, in long red handle underwear and carries a pitchfork. Friend, don't believe it. That's, that's, uh, that's a lie. He's a very beautiful individual and is more convincing than anyone that you've ever heard speak. And I tell you this, you shall hear him speak and teach to this world in the very near future, in person, in the form that he's always wanted to fulfill, even as the king of tires, he was supposed to be a protecting cherub of the mercy seat, the seat of Christ. He's going to take that seat. And many of you, that do not have your name written in that book. That's why some write and say, may I join your church? Hey, you got to take that up with him, friend. If your name isn't in his book, I can't help you. you got to take it up with him. If he approves you, oh, you're all right with me. I'll ride with you right to the very bitter end. It's not a bitter end, though. It's a wonderful, rewarding end. 
For as we read in chapter 17, we've got the victory. We have nothing to fear. Man only fears the unknown. Those little old puny tin horn king generals that are going to be set up, they're nothing. They can't even come to power on their own until Satan sets them up. And you're afraid of them when you serve and are a child of the living God? Come off of it. Stay in the simplicity of God's teaching. In other words, take the babble out of your mind, the confusion, and let the clarity of the living God be the seal in your forehead that you cannot be deceived in these end times. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. We'll talk about the religious beast in the next system, <laughs> the next lecture. You'll find that his system is very simple. When you listen to your Father's word instead of men. God bless you. You listen a moment, won't you please?